This evening we're um, considering another attribute of God that you already know. It has to do with his omnipotence. Let's read one passage as we begin that has to do with this in Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, verses 16 through 29. What we want to look at... Um, Actually, uh, let's look at, um, let's look at the, read through verse 26. Anyway, the verse we want to look at is verse 26, which gives to us the application of this absolute power of God to that which is most important, I think, to us as individuals, and that is it is what guarantees our salvation. Matthew chapter 19, beginning in verse 16. We read this. And behold, one came to him and said, Teacher, what good thing shall I do that I may obtain eternal life? And he said to him, Why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good. But if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments. And he said to him, Which ones? And Jesus said, You shall not commit murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. The young man said to him, all these things I have kept. What am I still lacking? Jesus said to him, if you wish to be complete, go and sell your possessions and give to the poor, and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come, follow me. When the young man heard this statement, he went away grieved, for he was one who owned much property. And Jesus said to his disciples, Surely I say to you, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And again I say to you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And when the disciples heard this, they were very astonished and said, Then who can be saved? And looking upon them, Jesus said to them, with men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. Let me just uh, point out a couple of things in this text. I think, first of all, it reinforces for us what we saw this morning with regard to the fact that God doesn't want to give to us a great deal of the things of the world because they will become a snare to us as they were to the rich young ruler. Uh, when Jesus told him what was necessary to enter into the kingdom of heaven, he actually believed that he had done what was required, that he had loved his neighbor as he loved himself. But when Jesus told him that he had to let go of his possessions, sell them all and give them to the poor, that he might have treasure in heaven, he wasn't able to do that because he had a great deal of property. He had a lot of the world's goods. And that kept him from being able to pursue the kingdom of heaven the way he needed to in order to be saved. Jesus put his finger on an idol that was keeping him back. Now, it is interesting that the disciples, when they heard what Jesus had to say about the rich man, asked the question, well, if he can't be saved, then who can be saved? Why would Jesus say that if the man was you know, in, in trap by all these possessions in the first place? Well, it's because those who were rich had the luxury of being able to pursue the things that they wanted to at their own leisure. They didn't have to work. This man could have pursued the kingdom of heaven with all of his time. And the disciples were a bit concerned about that. If a man who could devote all of his time to this can't be saved, then how are we going to be saved? Well, again, Jesus points out, uh, comes to the root of the matter and says, it's impossible with men. It doesn't matter how much time you have. It doesn't matter whether you're poor or rich. You actually could not enter the kingdom of heaven by yourself anyway. It has to be the work of God, but with God, it is possible. With men, it's impossible. The reason why it's possible with God is because God can do all things. All things are possible with God, especially the things that are most important to us, which is salvation. He is able to overcome the things that stand in our way. He can save us even though we cannot save ourselves. Now, as you know, we have been looking at these different attributes of God as the reasons why we should love him. And we did start with what we call the moral attributes of God, all those fruits 
that flow from his love as so many reasons why we ought to love him. And really, it's not hard to love a being who has infinite love, especially when that love is flowing out to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. That love is offered to us. That love is really given to us. And when we receive Jesus, we receive that love and all the benefits of it. It's not hard to love a God like that. But now we're looking at what we call his natural attributes, those things that have to do with his power, uh, actually with his greatness in every way. And these things can be reasons to love God as well, especially when they're combined with his infinite love. If God did not have this love, if he, um, well, if he was, let's say, a God of infinite evil or infinite hate, he would be one that would be infinitely to be feared. And certainly those who are outside of Christ should fear even a God of infinite love because he is a God who loves justice, as we saw. But, of course, combined with limitless love, and when that love is actually directed towards you, that becomes a reason to love him. Now, we have seen a few of these attributes as well. The fact that God is omniscient. <coughs> the fact that he knows absolutely everything. He knows everything that has already taken place. He knows everything that is going on now, everything that will go on in the future. As a matter of fact, he even knows what might go on if circumstances were different. God knows all these things, and of course he knows them because... Well, he has infinite knowledge, but also because it is a part of his plan. We saw the connection between his knowledge and his plan. God knows something's going to take place. He either agrees with it or doesn't agree with it. If he doesn't agree with it, he changes it. But if he knows it's going to take place, it must mean he agrees that that should take place, which means it is his will. The fact that God knows everything that's going to take place means that that is his will. But again, that's all tied up in the sovereignty of God for another subject, but this is the important point. The fact is, God, knowing everything that's taken place regarding us, knowing everything that we're doing, everything that's going on with us right now in our minds and in our hearts, even knowing what we're going to do in the future, and one thing we didn't mention under this topic is he not only knows what you're going to do in the future, but he knows what you would do under any given set of circumstances. And knowing all those things, and again, realizing what the Bible says is true about us, he still chose you. He still granted you mercy. He still uh, decided to set his love upon you so that when you do sin, and we all sin, doesn't take God by surprise. God knew it in advance. He's not going to reject you for it. He's not going to cast you out of his family he knows these things, and yet he still loves you. And that is a marvelous truth and a reason why you should love God for his omniscience. Again, you can't do anything that's ever going to surprise him. It doesn't give you an excuse to sin, of course. We should not sin that God's grace may abound, but just realize that God knew you were going to do that. He still chose you. He still saved you. He still brought you into his family, and he's still going to keep you because the choice was his, ultimately, and not yours. We saw, secondly, that God is omnipresent, which means that he is everywhere at once. He sees everything you're doing. He is present everywhere to help you. We also saw how God's uh, omnipresence uh, helps us to resist sin. I mean, how can you even think about doing something that's wrong. Sadly, we still do. But how can you really think about that if you know that God is right there? That he is just as present here as he is in heaven, although in a different way. I mean, if God showed you that he was there, that would certainly make you stop. But the fact is, you need to see that he is through the eyes of faith. And when you see that, then it helps you resist sin. When you see that he's there in the trouble that you're, you're going through, you know he is present to help as well. Again, his omnipresence can be a great blessing and a reason why we should love him, especially because it is exercised in love toward you. God loves you, and so he is present to bless you. Now, this evening, we're going to look at another one of his attributes. That, you, know, you might say the three omnis. This would be the third. 
and that is God's omnipotence. Now this morning, remember, we saw what Jesus meant when he said, all things are possible to those who believe. It means that God will do everything that he has promised if we ask him in faith. One thing we didn't talk about is the fact that we do need to wait on him for his timing, and we'll, we'll look at that a little bit this evening. But now we want to focus on the fact that it is God, it's God by his infinite power that does these things. It's not faith that causes these things to take place, which actually some people believe. Somehow faith has the power to move mountains by itself, but it's not our faith, it's God. Basically, Jesus means by this what our text tells us, that these things are only possible because all things are possible with God, who has infinite power. So this evening, let's consider two things. First of all, that God has unlimited power. And secondly, that because he does, he can, and he will fulfill all of his promises, particularly the one to save us. He will bring us to heaven. Now, I am going to, um, in this particular sermon, talk about a number of examples I have from the past of abuses of these kinds of things, particularly in the abuses that are attached to faith. And we're going to see that under the first point, that God has unlimited power. Now, we do want to understand what this means. And I think, again, the best way to um, look at this or to understand this is to consider what it doesn't mean. It is interesting that in the history of the church, in the history of, let's say, the interpretation of the Bible, for every truth the Bible contains, there is an opposing, a corresponding opposing error. Uh, that shouldn't surprise us because there is a devil who is a liar and he is constantly trying to get even the people of God to believe things that aren't true because the more he does that, the more he realizes he's going to make them ineffective in assaulting his kingdom. Now, one thing we saw, we actually saw one of these errors this morning. When Jesus says, all things are possible to those who believe, some take all things to refer to whatever their sinful hearts desire. But you know from what we saw this morning, and hopefully you knew this anyway, that there are some things that God will not give you because he knows these things will hurt you. The things he will give you are the things he has promised, because those things alone are good. Now, the same thing is true here with regard to the omnipotence of God. Jesus says, with God, all things are possible, but there are those who distort this truth as well. And if I can point fingers in this case, and hopefully no one will be offended by this, the, the people who are most guilty of this fall in what we call the full gospel, Pentecostal, charismatic camp. Now, not everybody who is in that camp falls into this, but these are the ones most liable to do this. I actually have several examples from my own personal history. Years ago, I was um, actually riding with a friend who was going to take over my place in this delivery job that I was doing. We were listening to... Christian radio, <laughs> and as you know, on Christian radio, there's a lot of stuff on there that isn't necessarily uh, Christian. But there was a woman who was preaching, a woman preacher. Again, I put that in quotation marks because the Bible actually tells us that women shouldn't be preachers. But she was, she was preaching, and she was quoting uh, Matthew 28, 18, which I, I hope you know very well by this time, where Jesus says, all power and authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now, after she read this passage, she then applied it to herself. She said, do you see what this says? All power and authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. At that point, of course, we <laughs> looked at each other and, and, and we were, you know, I mean, what can you do with that? that that's, that's heretical, that's blasphemy. God doesn't give all power and authority to anyone but to his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I heard another speaker, I think, on the same radio station talking about the keys of the kingdom and how the keys of the kingdom had been entrusted to him. He had the key of health. 
He had the key of wealth. He had the key of healing. All those powers and authorities were entrusted to him. But again, those are the things entrusted to the son if he's willing to give them or hold them. It's all within his power. And then perhaps the greatest offense, and here I might again name names, point fingers, only because I think people need to know that these things are dangerous. Now, these two may not be as prominent as they were in the past when I heard them say this, but they are still on television. Uh, Trinity Broadcasting. Uh, they were interviewing, the, the hosts, Paul and Jan Crouch, were interviewing a woman by the name of Joanna Michelson, and also a man by the name, I think you'll recognize, Hal Lindsey. But it was actually Joanna Michelson, and the book that she had just written called The Beautiful Side of Evil, Joanna Michelson had previously been a practicing witch, and she had been delivered from that by the gospel of Christ, and so she was wanting to expose what it is that they were doing. Now, one of the things that she pointed out on this particular program that witches do was the practice of visualization. And she said that there were many witches she knew and warlocks who could see things happen in their mind. And if they could see it happen, these things actually would happen. Now, the sad thing that happened was no sooner had she finished explaining what witches do that Jan chimed in and said, she does this all the time. That's what she does. Doesn't the Lord say in his word that we call into being those things which do not exist? She applied that to herself. Now, the Bible does actually say something to this effect that God is the one who calls into being those things that do not exist. That power is not given to man. That power is God's power. And I remember that Joanna was looking at um, Jan in disbelief, trying to very kindly point out to her that what she was talking about was not Christianity, but it was witchcraft. Now, when Jesus says that all things are possible to those who believe, he, he doesn't mean that our faith is what makes these things happen, God is the one who makes these things happen. It is his power. And he can do it because he has unlimited power. God can do whatever he wants to do. There is no limit to his strength. It is as infinite as all of his other attributes. And again, the greatest example God wanted to create a world. And he did it by speaking a word. And it came into being. Actually, the Bible says that God spoke eight times over a period of six days. And he created all that we see. You know, let me just pause here for a moment on the doctrine of creation because this is the one most appealed to, I believe, in Scripture to demonstrate the power of God. It's one thing that God could reach down into the dust of the earth and, and form a man and breathe into his nostrils the breath of life and make him a living being. When we consider all that goes into a human being, that's amazing. But the fact is God created not only us, which shows marvelous wisdom, as we've already seen. We're fearfully and wonderfully made. But when you consider the universe was created by God, I think that's a much greater display of his power but do you realize that God created these things in the space of six days? Now, some Christians seem to have a hard time with believing that God could do this in six days. They don't seem to be able to conceive of God being able to do something so great over such a short period of time. I think they think it's easier to believe that billions of years, God could do it in billions of years. Uh, but six days, well... That's kind of hard to believe. Now, again, some of the reasons why some even believers, sadly, believe this is because they have bought into the evolutionary dating methods, which have been proven uh, to be somewhat biased. You basically find what you want to find as you go out and uh, into the world and look at the different um, uh, radiological chronometers, these different clocks that the Lord has put into the world. They don't actually say that the world is, is that old. Um, and we don't have time, of course, to critique those things, but there are, are many good critiques of those things available. But again, if there's more time, it seems to be more believable. And yet there are others who actually uh, 
have this understanding of the infinite power of God who look at the same thing and come to the opposite conclusion. I mean, for instance, if you read Genesis 1, you realize that God has infinite power. Then why would he take six days to do something that he could have done just as easily in a moment of time? You know, Augustine actually had that problem, and, and that he would be in the, uh, the fourth and fifth century. He said he thought the same thing. Why would God do over six days what he could just simply speak into existence in a moment? So Augustine believed that really what God did was he did create everything instantly. Now we do, of course, have to take into account what Genesis says. God did create in six days. And the reason why he did that was to establish the work week for us. I think that's really the only reason why he took six days to do something he could have done in an instant because he wanted to establish the work week, work six days and rest on the seventh just as God did. But again, the point is God could have done it in a moment of time if he wanted to. As a matter of fact, the Lord did when it came to the universe. It was just one of his fiat acts, one of his, his statements. Let it be. And it was. God simply spoke and it came into existence. Now let's not forget what we're talking about here. When we look out into the starry heavens in the, in the middle of, the, um, of this city, it's really hard to see what's out there. You know, you see maybe a few stars, some of the brighter ones, and it doesn't look all that impressive. There's some space and there's some stars. But have you been up to, um, up to the mountains lately in the middle of the night when there isn't a full moon and, and you see the stars shining without the city lights down below? Have you, have you ever done that? If you haven't, you need to do that. Because what you see are as many stars as the sand of the sea. There are lots of them out there. You just can't see them because of the city lights. That's why when the Lord was telling Abraham how many offspring he would have, how many children, he says, look at the stars and count them if you can. Well, we look at our, at our nights and we say, well, let's see, there's about oh, there's 50 or, or so out there. That's not very many. But if you look at the top of a mountain without the city lights and you see the stars, there's no way you can count them. Scientists actually estimate that in our galaxy alone, there are some 200 to 400 billion stars in our galaxy. That's the Milky Way galaxy. Now, that's not the universe. That's just our galaxy. And scientists estimate that there are hundreds of billions of galaxies in the universe that are perhaps the same size as the Milky Way galaxy. That <clears throat> is a lot. Now, I know Carl Sagan used to say, if life only exists on this earth and there's no life and all these galaxies and all these planets and so forth that are out there, then this universe is an incredible waste of space. But again, it's not a waste. If the Lord intended by this to show us his power and his glory, it does reveal that to us. It is incredible. But again, who can understand infinite power. Now again, God spoke and all these things came into being in a moment. Yes, he did take six days over which he created all things, but the, the command to create the stars and you know, again, the heavens of the universe um, only was one command in Genesis 1, 14 through 18. The Lord said, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the expanse of the heavens to give light on the earth. And it was so. God spoke, and it came into being. Now, is it hard for you to believe that God could just simply speak the word, and the whole universe could come into existence, where there was nothing before that? Actually, according to the order of creation, the only thing that existed would be the space and the fact that the earth was here, and then God created all the stars. I don't know if you remember when Dr. Hartnett was here, but he showed from, from the findings that they're getting from uh, the, the uh, uh, telescopes that they have orbiting around the earth that we are, in fact, at the center of what appears to be a symmetrical universe. All these galaxies out there seem to form this, this hole with the earth at the relative center of all these things, which 
seems to corroborate what the Bible says. The world was here, the earth was here, and then on, was it the fourth day, the Lord created the lights, he created the stars, he created the sun and the moon. Can you conceive of that? Can you believe that? Well, if you can't, then the idea that you have of God is too small. I remember uh, years ago going to an observatory and looking at the pictures that had been taken of the nebula and the universes and some of these billions of galaxies that are out there. And I remember when I saw those things that I had a, a moment of crisis because my conception of God was not great enough to account for all that space and all those galaxies and things that were out there. The fact is that my conception of God might have been that he was just a man-sized God sitting on a throne in heaven. And I couldn't conceive of that much power in this man-sized God. But the fact is he isn't man-sized. He is infinite, as we saw. He is omnipresent. His, his being fills everything. There's no limit to God. Even as there's no limit to his being, there is no limit at all to his power. He can do anything he wants to do. Again, Jeremiah writes in our memory verse and our meditation something that, that was amazing to him. I mean, he could see the starry heavens, but he didn't have the understanding that we have. But he still says this, Ah, Lord God! Behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. Oh, if you can make all this, then whatever I ask, whatever you just tell me you're going to do, I can believe that because that's nothing compared to this. Well, that's the kind of conception that you need to have of God's power. Now, you know, there's always going to be those naysayers and those critics who are going to argue that that isn't true. God really can't do everything, that he is limited. Maybe you've heard some of their arguments, which really aren't too compelling. They would say there's at least three things God can't do. He can't lie. But is that a limit to his power? I mean, doesn't that say something to the moral integrity of God, that he must tell the truth? That's not a limitation. That's a virtue. He can't sin. Well, same thing. God is infinitely moral and he is absolutely perfect. That's not a limitation. That's a strength. And then he can't make a rock so big that even he can't lift it. You've probably heard of that conundrum. If you say that he can't make the rock that's so big that he can't lift it, well, then he's limited in his creative ability. Can't make a big enough rock. But if you say that he can make the rock, but he can't lift it, then you're questioning his strength. But again, the answer to the question just shows God's infinite strength because God can make a rock as big as he wants and he will always be able to lift it because he will have absolute sovereignty over everything that he has made. God made the universe and God can lift it. <laughs> I mean, he does lift it. What keeps it suspended in the place that it is? I understand the galaxies are moving. Well, that's fine. But they're not just falling out of the sky. God's upholding them. And he is keeping them in being. He's not only the one who made them, but he is also the one who keeps them in being. He is holding them up, as it were. If God did not hold things up, if he didn't hold us up, we would simply disappear into nothingness. God has infinite power. Of course, there's other things that God can't do as well. God can't cease to be God. God can't die. But these are strengths, not weaknesses. God has infinite strength. Well, now we get to the so what. What difference does it make that God has this power? Well, again, the important thing is for us personally is that because God has this power, he can fulfill his promises. He will fulfill these promises because of his integrity. He will bring our salvation to its completion. We will be saved. And God can do this with infinite ease. If God can speak and bring the universe into existence, can he bring the souls of his people to heaven? Well, of course he can. Paul writes in Philippians 4.19, And my God will supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Christ Jesus. 
It is no trouble at all for God to do whatever he has promised that he will do. Now, again, he may not necessarily fulfill these promises at the time you want him to do it, the time I want him to do it. Sometimes God will wait in his answers uh, to even the things he has promised because he knows by waiting that he will receive more glory and by waiting the answers to those prayers will be more useful to you, but he will do them. If we ask anything according to his will, we know that we have received what we asked because God has promised, because God cannot lie, because God has the power to do it. He will do it. Now again, most importantly, because the Lord has infinite power, you can know that you will make it to heaven. God, by his infinite power, that's, that's how the Lord overcame your heart. Do you realize that the only thing that was standing between you and salvation, once the Lord provided the Lord Jesus Christ, was only your heart. You were dead in your sins. But God, by his infinite power, made you alive. God has the power to overcome your heart. Paul writes this in Ephesians 2, verses 3 through 5. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. God has the power to raise you from spiritual death to spiritual life. His infinite power is what enables him to do this. Now the Lord in his infinite strength can also overcome one of your greatest enemies, which is your sin. By the way, that's extremely comforting to know that God has the power to subdue my heart. He was able to subdue it in bringing me to himself and bringing you to himself. He is also able to subdue your heart, of course, after he has brought you to himself. He is able to overcome your sins. Now, the Lord says he's not going to do it all at once. There is going to be a struggle. Paul writes in Galatians 5.17, For the flesh sets its desire against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. But he also says he will give you the strength to overcome your sins. You realize if God didn't do this, you would be lost. He says in verse 6, but I say walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. God subdued your hearts when he saved you. God continues to subdue your heart by his Spirit, by his power. And finally, the Lord says that he will overcome all of your enemies by his infinite power and he will bring you to heaven. Again, I'm just talking about the things that, that are most, most intimately concerned with us. As far as God's omnipotence, what difference does it make? It means you will be saved. It makes all the difference between going to hell and going to heaven. Because if God did not have omnipotent power, there is no way that he could guarantee that you would make it to heaven. But the fact that he has it means you can and will be saved. Jesus says in John 10, verses 27 through 29, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them, and they will never perish. And notice, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. No one can. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Why can't the enemy take us away from God? Why can't he condemn us? Why can't he cast us into hell along with himself? It's because of God's infinite power. No one is able to snatch us from the Father's hand. Paul actually uh, talks about every created thing, that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ because of his infinite power. He says, well, tribulation or distress or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword. Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. 
But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The reason why these things cannot separate us from God is because God has unlimited power. That's why Paul could write in Philippians 1.6, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. And so the Lord can and he will overcome those enemies that stand between you and eternal life. He will overcome the devil, he will overcome the world, and he will overcome the flesh because they all have limited power. But he has limitless power. Now again, the question that you need to ask yourself this evening is, can you love a God like this? And do you love him? Would you have God to be any other way than what he is? I've already said, if God did not have infinite power, then you could never be safe. The possibility would always exist that one of your enemies might snatch you out of his hands and destroy you. But because his power is infinite, there is no possibility that that could, po that, that could happen. <laughs> it's another reason why. You should love him. Infinite power means eternal safety. And that's what God has. And that's why you should love him if you are a believer here this evening. Now, you need to realize infinite power works against you if you're not a believer here this evening. Uh, because that infinite power means that he will execute his judgment upon you if you don't repent and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. If that's the case with you, turn from your sins. Trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and then infinite power will be your ally. You know that I've already mentioned the Lord actually has to change your heart in order for you to come to him. If you cannot trust in the Lord, if you cannot turn from your sins, then look to him because he's the only one who can break the hold your flesh has. He is the only one who can break the hold the world has. He's the only one who can break the hold the devil has on your life. Look to Jesus for his power and his strength to overcome. Trust in him and then be, by God's infinite power, forever safe. Well, let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us take what we've heard and apply it.